for the public in general, I think traditional martial arts are still highly valuable in the sense that there's a kind of slower on ramping, like in as far as like before you get to spar, you have to do these things. You have to develop this certain baseline level of fitness. You have to develop this level of coordination. You have to train your memory as far as like, let's say pre-established forms or kata or things like that. I think those are great. Um, but to conflate that kind of training with like, ah, now this is, this is like real street, real world street self-defense. Maybe, maybe not, you know, like it, it really depends on, on the individual school. I've never had a time in my professional life where Americans have been more concerned about their own self-protection. Traditional martial arts, do they have any place in today's violent society? You know, if you're looking for your own self-protection, can you get anything out of traditional martial arts? Well, today I'm going to introduce you to somebody, one of my favorite people in the industry, and he is going to talk just about that. But before we get there, remember, subscribe to the channel. I'm getting amazing feedback from all the subject matter experts that we have you know, on the channel and it's growing because you're sharing this with other people. So please do that. Subscriptions are important. Notification bell is really important. And please, please, please make comments on these, uh, on all these interviews that we do. It, uh, it makes a huge difference. So, uh, also go to timlarkin.com, sign up for your free masterclass. That way I can talk in depth, uncensored about all the information that's important to make sure that you minimize the chance of violence ever coming in your life. So today, I get to go and, you know, I know a lot of people in the industry. Uh, this is truly one of my favorite people. Uh, Mark and I have known each other for decades and uh, just an outstanding individual, just a true renaissance man. Not only is he an amazing martial artist, he's also just so knowledgeable in the fitness industry and all, all aspects of functional fitness, Chinese medicine, he's a doctor of Chinese medicine. Um, he knows everybody, literally everybody in the uh, fitness world and in the uh, martial arts world. And he, he's just a great uh, person. I met him originally when he was an editor with Black Belt Magazine. And he came to a TFT seminar to evaluate it, to see you know what could anybody actually learn in two days. And um, he was very complimentary. And uh, just it was a great article. And it started a really, really long term friendship. So anybody that knows Mark knows what an amazing guy he is. Uh, I really enjoyed this interview with him. It really puts into context a lot of things. We talk about all aspects of violence. We talk about, you know, the importance of uh, functional fitness. What do you get from the traditional martial arts? The surprising use of traditional martial arts within the combat sports. And uh, just kind of a status of the industry. It's, it's really a great interview and I hope you enjoy it. So without further ado, Dr. Mark Chang. Dr. Mark Chang, we are finally talking. It's been way too long, sir. <laughs> man, I can't. Well, at least it's virtual, man. At least at least we can see each other, and, and that's a good thing. It's been too long, especially since uh, you know the the pandemic hit that uh, we've actually been able to have any time together. But you know, I've wanted to talk to you for quite some time about the status of the industry. You know, um, for you know, you're you're very well versed in you know not just. The Chinese martial arts, but the martial arts community as a whole. Um, you know, you were an editor for Black Belt Magazine. Uh, for those kids that don't understand what a magazine is, it was this actually booklet <laughs> of papers that you'd read through. Um, and and you know, you you really looked at a lot, and you've trained with a lot of just different martial artists through the world. And the question that I always get from people is, how is martial arts relevant today? meaning the, the, you know, the, the preponderance of MMA coming in, it, it, people are very dismissive of, of the martial arts. And you're somebody that I, I get from your posts and from your teachings, you really try to educate people on the nuances that are there because there's a lot of nuance. And as you and I were talking earlier, what's interesting is a lot of the big breakthroughs that come in MMA is usually somebody applying a martial arts principle you know, our martial arts strike that just was before unknown to, uh, to that, you know, platform. So it, could, could you talk to the status, how you see martial arts right now and, and how you see the industry in, 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 on the whole? Sure. Gladly. Um, I think part of the, the conversation needs to establish the semantics first. I think all of us are kind of doing martial arts in some way, shape or form, but the traditional martial arts or the classical martial arts to, um, 
specify them as such, I think um, are the ones that we're kind of talking about here. Like mixed martial arts are certainly martial arts too. Um, you know, fitness-based martial arts. I mean, let's let's call them what they are. They're still martial art derived, but the old school traditional martial arts, I think, are the ones that um, more often than not are seen seen as kind of like on on unstable ground. And and I think as the industries evolved a lot, and as mixed martial arts is certainly like, I think mixed martial arts, to be honest, in my opinion, has been one of the great um, awakening, rude awakenings for a lot of traditional martial arts, arts practitioners out there. Um, certainly there've been a lot of, of martial artists here in the States and overseas that have said like, oh yes, I'm great. I can, my style does this, my style does that. And they hide behind this kind of veil of like reputation rather than like, okay, let's get on the mat. Let's find out glove up or like, let's, let's do it right now. Let's, let's see who's got what. Um, and until you have that, like, you know, rubber meets road moment of reality, you have great theories. And I think theories without testing, without pressure testing um, can, can lead to kind of delusion at times. So I, honestly, like my personal feeling is that some of the, the, the modern martial arts practices where there's, there is more sparring, there is more contesting have been great. However, I think that without a grounding in ethics without a grounding in a code of behavior without a grounding in like a lot of the principles that you cover very very explicitly in target focus training as far as you know a social violence versus you know social threat or social like social posturing i think a lot of these nuances need to be um far better explained um to the average mma fighter um, and certainly most professional mma fighters are, are a little bit more more clear on that. They're like, I make money doing this stuff. Why should I fight you for free? Um, so I, I, I like that that idea of it, but I think a lot of the traditional martial arts uh, have needed, in terms of like this pressure testing, needed some needed some of the um, proverbial come to Jesus moments that MMA have have provided for them. Um, for the public in general, I think traditional martial arts are still highly valuable in the sense that there's a kind of slower on ramping, like in as far as like before you get to spar, you have to do these things. You have to develop this certain baseline level of fitness. You have to develop this level of coordination. You have to train your memory as far as like, let's say pre-established forms or kata or things like that. I think those are great. Um, but to conflate that kind of training with like, ah, now this is, this is like real street, real world street self-defense. Maybe, maybe not, you know, like it, it really depends on, on the individual school. Yeah. I, I found um, what, what, what's so funny is to me is the oftentimes that the MMA guys, they do, and they, they get in the ring and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a grin agreed upon rules, a lot of conditions that are in there, but no doubt they, they uh, pressure test everything. And it's interesting to see how it comes out. But what's interesting is some of the stuff that they deride uh, on traditional martial arts, they just do a different version of, you know, like they do, like a lot of them started to do really slow, deliberate training, which, you know, they, they deride as a kata. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, I think that to me, you know, I think, I think the, the name kata has such a bad rap now because they, they basically say it's worthless momentum, meaning it's not real fighting and everything. And I, I think if we reframed it, to follow kind of the movement, um, you know, uh, uh, approach to things like the Edo portals of the world and, and, you know, the animal flow and stuff like that. A lot of that was already done in martial arts in, in the forms. I agree that some of the, the competition katas and things like that um, may not be as applicable, but a lot of the movement that I learned having to do uh, slow movement in kata uh, really helped with a lot of things in development of power and um, focus on, on a lot of things. And um, I, I just think what's happening is because they think it, it's an old name, they, they don't understand they're, they're doing a version of it because there's only so many ways to train the human body how to move correctly. And the principles can't be violated. You can change the names up. You can, you can change the methods, get a more effective method, but you're still doing some form of that because if not, you know, you're not gonna have the ability to be a competitor at the, at the levels these guys are at. 
I mean, look at shadow boxing, look at boxing, you know, it's just any, you go into any boxing ring and what do you see guys doing? Like inevitably there's some guy just throwing hands, shadow boxing, right? right. What is shadow boxing? It's it, in a way, it's kind of like a freestyle kata. So if you're, if you're going to deride kata as a whole, then you've got to, you've got to throw, you know, shadow boxing under that bus too. Yeah. I think the thing that, that lends people to throw each other or, or facets of each other's culture under the bus is just ignorance. Like we don't understand the context like ignorance of context. I'm not saying ignorance, wholesale ignorance, but like yeah. ignorance of context. Like if you don't understand the context of the kata or why they're doing a particular move, like a kata is just a codex. It's a list of moves that you could do, right? It right. doesn't have to be in a particular order within like a freestyle fight. But for the kata, for the, like the, the listing of it, it's almost like saying your ABCs. I mean, you could put letters together in any order depending on context to make a word. But you don't have to say that every single every time you write a letter, it has to be followed by B and then C and then D. Right. Yeah, we, we talk about the idea of, uh, of like we will we will show a movement pattern and we call it a coordination set because the the goal is not that we think that is how a conflict will go down or anything, but it's to force you to do movements and strikes in a manner that if left to your own, uh, you know, devices, you probably never would challenge yourself that way. It's, it's to coordinate the body. It's, it's in there. And we say the idea, like, we're going to give you all of this, then we're going to take the Legos all apart, throw them on the ground. And then you're going to, you know, you're going to, you're going to work with it. And what's interesting is when you do that, all of a sudden in your free practice, in your sparring, you're, you're seeing new opportunities. And the reason you were able to see those new opportunities is because you slowly and methodically went through um, some new movement patterns that, that, that opened up. And I just don't, I see what's so funny is there's so many aspects that when, when I watch you like post some of your, your trainings and how you're, you're slowly learning, it might be, you might be working with one of the weapons or something, but it's that slow, deliberate training. And when you, you know, it, when people deride that, they forget that every lethal aspect of training firearms, everything all starts out with slow, deliberate practice, you know, that you know, make, you know, when I, when I learned anything in the, in the military that was lethal with, with weapons, it was taught calmly. It was taught slowly and they had to make sure that we had all our mechanics together. The whole idea of crawl, walk, run was the approach. Traditional martial arts have done that ad infinitum. I mean, that was, that was really how the progression always happened. Certainly. I mean, like if you look at a lot of the traditional martial arts, it's sort of like before you even get to learn the stances, you've got to like work on the stretches, you've got to work on the basics, you got to work on the fundamental physical attributes, developing those attributes, so that you can then absorb physically absorb the training methods without getting hurt, without getting like overstrained. So like, what a lot of people want to do is, is look at that, that those prerequisites, those physical prerequisites and say, like, ah, that's not fighting, I'm not here for that. Yeah, but if you're going to train fighting, and your body's not physically prepared for that, you're going to have a real short shelf life. Yeah. Um, and I think that context is kind of lost on a lot of people coming in. Like they, they think like, well, I don't hurt. I can do this. But are you ready for those kinds of loads, those kinds of reps, that kind of threat? And are you able to then ratchet your nervous system down, like out of sympathetic nervous system dominant to being able to be parasympathetic, chill, like responsive and like able to release? You know, it's really interesting. Um, I, I just heard an interview and I uh, got the book, uh, Rick Hicks and Gracie's book, uh, Breathe. Yes. And, and he talks, and, and here's a guy who's, you know, at, at his height was was just, you know, the ultimate um, aspect of an MMA fighter at, at that time. You know, he really defined it. Um, yes. And yet what he, what he really focused on was controlling himself, meaning his self-discipline, his control of his breath. His, I mean, he goes really in depth in that. And I think people just gloss over that, you know, when, when, when they come in. I, I, uh, I, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting him years ago, and he was uh, training with a friend of mine, Charles Stelly. And hmm. I just briefly, just briefly met him, you know, uh, on that when he was preparing for one of his fights. And he was just a totally humble guy. But to watch him prep and to do things, you know, he had very deliberate, very slow movements. Um, and that, that allowed him to, when he, when he unleashed uh, on something, when he had to unleash, he could do that. But exactly what you're saying his real, he said his real, um, superpower 
was the fact that he could control his system, you know, and control his breathing. And he could just always outlast his partner. His cardio was never an issue that way. And um, th there's just a lot of things that I think that I learned in martial arts, you know, breathing was the, the first time I was introduced to any sort of meditative breathing or, or anything was my martial arts training. I wasn't really introduced to it in boxing. I wasn't really introduced to it. Uh, my wrestling when I was a kid uh, on the Navy basis, it wasn't until I went to my first, um, you know, martial arts school that they even discussed the idea of breath and, and how you could use it. Mm. And um, I noticed that a lot of fighters today, you know, a lot of the well-known fighters, they're really going back to that idea of breath control and and understanding how to you know really maximize um, their ability to to outlast their their opponents, but in order to do that, that slow everything down and really be you know you really have to be aware of of how this you know the the the, the nervous system affects it. You you obviously are far more versed on that as me, and and to let people know about you know your your medical background, how how have you found incorporating your knowledge of medicine into your trainings and then also for your clients because i know you're really very big on on trying to keep people as holistic as possible and and get the most out of themselves where do you see people failing in, in those in those arenas you know especially when they're getting injuries and things like that wow um as far as where do i see people failing i think a lot of the people who are in let's say fitness or martial arts end up failing because they push too hard too soon um, it very rarely do I see people like truly fail, uh, in the sense that they're just not pushing enough. Right. Um, you know, the people that aren't pushing enough are the people that, that could afford to like, you know, hold themselves to a little bit more discipline as far as like what they eat, how, how they moderate the lifestyle. And really for them, a lot of that is just an internal conversation that they need to have with themselves. Are you being honest with yourself? But the people that are getting hurt, I mean, to me, failure is sort of like something that benches you where like it takes you out of the game. You don't, you don't have the ability to ramp up because you, you're, you're, there's, a, there's some sort of physical limitation. People I think are failing in the sense that like they're, they're, they get seduced by um, like this, uh, I'm trying to think of the right, the right word, but they're, they're, they get seduced by like the, this feeling of like, I gotta, I gotta like, go all in or all out or like go home. Right. And there's a time and a place for that. But in terms of being able to, understand progression, the value of progression, and the ability to be thorough and slow and mindful is very tough, especially in the age of like Instagram, where you can just pick up your phone and swipe through. It's like, you're not even paying attention to like the caption, the completeness of the image, whatever, right? Like there's, we're, we're like microseconds of attention these days, like rather than like, e than even seconds. So like, I think a lot of times people are too busy, like wanting to get onto the next thing because they associate that with achievement or success rather than understanding like the depth of importance of a lot of these details in something relatively simple. Like for example, when I teach a deadlift or a swing, right? A kettlebell deadlift or a swing, right? I mean, I break it down to like, here are your foot positions. Here's your stance. Here's your lockout. Here are the things that you need to be feeling. And I, and I allow them time in each one of those basic positions so that they can really feel it out. And then if they can feel it out properly and, and understand like, ah, and have those aha moments, you will see immediately as the instructor or trainer, how differently they move, how differently they comport themselves. And then how differently they're, they're then able to handle load without the threat of stress or injury. You know, that's, I think, something that we as, as um, thought leaders, as instructors, as industry professionals need to do a better job of. You've really been at the forefront. I mean, um, you know, of the, the whole idea of integrating physical training for results, you know, for a result in there and in, in movement training on that over the years, obviously you've worked with, you know, uh, you know, well-known people like, you know, Pavel Satsuman, um, you've, you've developed, you know, your, your program that, that you teach, but what do you, uh, what do you think for somebody that is, you know, interested in basic martial arts, you know, some, some form of martial arts, some form of, of self-defense training, um, but they're not really sure how to, do something where they can stay fit at the same time. Meaning that I, I think a lot of times what, what people do is they, they make it too hard on themselves. They think they have to go into some all out CrossFit, you know, crazy, you know, wad right away, rather than saying, okay, this is where I'm at right now. I'm just starting out doing this. I really like 
you know, whatever it is, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, whatever they're doing, but they're saying, Hey, my, my conditioning could be better. It'll get a little bit better working here, but, but what are some basic things I can implement right now with some simple tools to, to start making myself, you know, your human machine is your human machine and we have limited limit limitations to it, but there's a lot of things we can do to improve that no matter what our age is. And, and what have you seen as some of the biggest breakthroughs since you've been studying um, this and applying it now, because you apply it, you, you have a lot of top people that come and train with you. I've been really lucky. I've had everyone from like, you know, the, the C-suite guys to pro athletes to, you know, random celebs, you, you know, come by here um, and hang out uh, or train or get treated or whatever. So it's, it's been, a, it, I've been very privileged um, to have these people to work with. But yeah, I think one of the reasons why back in the day I put together that the Tai Cheng program for Beachbody, honestly, yeah. was because I saw so many people trying to fast track themselves to fitness or fast track themselves to sports ability or fast track themselves to some kind of result um, without meeting the prerequisites of movement. And so like as someone that comes a little bit from academia too, like I, there've been times in college, like I'll petition, I'll petition a, a, a professor and be like, Hey, sir, can I take this class? I'm like, I know I don't have all the prereqs, but like I'll work hard and I'll do it. And the professor's like, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Like give you the signature. And then you go and you enroll in the class. Well, if you don't meet the prerequisites for, for the class, then the material is going to be that much harder. You are really going to have to work that much harder to absorb the content like that's just to pass the class, Never mind to really benefit from it and like use it. So like my whole thing now, especially as an adult who doesn't have to go, like I don't have that, that obligation to go back and, and, you know, sit through classes, get another degree, what, what. So for me now I'm realizing, man, if I really want to have the best results, really want to have the deepest mastery for me to slow down enough to actually appreciate, observe, like digest, the fundamentals, like that's where it's at. So oftentimes when I work with the athletes, especially pro athletes, it's rarely me, little old me teaching a professional athlete, like an NBA player or a profet or a, a MLB player or a, a bot pro boxer, a new move. It's not that it's more like where are the fundamentals of movement that you might've glossed over in your training that like you are allowed to compensate for in your sport but if you did X, Y, and Z, it would actually help you recover better, help your body do what you do anyway, but more efficiently. And so I think those are the things that we need to, we need to focus in on. And that's part of the reason why I put together the Tai Cheng program for Beachbody, just to slow people down and look at, okay, can you stand? Can you balance? And a lot of people go like, oh, can I stand? Of course I can stand. But like, how do you stand? Like, one of the things I always talk about is like our bodies, our, our nervous systems are calibrated. And so whatever we do, we assume that that's the norm because that's our norm, but that may not be the optimal norm. So like how you're standing, do, does your head stack atop your shoulders at any given moment? Unless of course you have to crouch for like, let's say pro boxing, like the ergonomics are different in, in each particular sport. Or do you have to, you know, sit back into a cockpit or do something different for your job, for your industrial ergonomics? And if the answer is no, like if you're just sitting, standing, walking, doing activities of daily life, why would you want to like crouch your head in, in the same way you would if you were a pro boxer? So I ask these things, I ask these questions and I, and I think like for programs like Tai Cheng, it helps point out where those little miscalibrations are. Like if we're standing, like are your hips actually slightly flexed? Are your hips not like in true neutral? because we've spent so much time in hip flexion that our brains don't recognize like true neutral as neutral anymore. Like these are the, these are the kinds of things like going slow allows you to become cognizant of and feel so that you can then correct them. And then you can have better performance and longevity. Okay. I think that's a great place to end at part one. You know, it, the concept, the, the, the one idea I think in all of training that is so misunderstood is the idea of slow, deliberate training. And I think Mark just gave you a, just a ton of great reasons why you want to do that and how important that is. And what a lot of people just want to rush to, through whatever they want to do. They just don't want to do it, you know, full speed, the whole thing. What they don't understand is you will be that much more effective if you truly understand proper structure and, and proper body mechanics. 
because those are the things that allow you to deploy the body weight. Those are the things that allow you to be able to be braced when you actually do deploy force. All of that stuff's so key. And Mark is just so good at explaining it, but also teaching it. And so I hope uh, you got a lot out of this. Uh, part two is, is coming up and we'll be talking about, again, more of the same. But you get this unique take that this man has. He's so humble and he's so proficient at what he does. And just his explanations, I think, are just second to none. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed this first one. Remember, go to timlarkin.com, get your free masterclass there, join the, subscribe to this channel and tell your friends about it, you know, continue to grow this channel and I'll continue to bring you great subject matter experts like Mark Chang. All right. Thank you.